Heterodorks. Heterodox dorks. Well, hello again, turfs and trannies. This is Corinna Cohn taking yet another stab at doing the intro, Nina. I feel like I'm doing most of the labor around here at this point. Well, I'm I'm Corinna. Yes, and you do do most of the labor at this point. Um, we have the traditional uh, turf and tranny division of labor. Right. Uh, and that <laughs> means that the tranny does most of the labor because you're the exploited class. This is as close to labor as I'll ever experience. <laughs> I am Nina Paley, your co-host of Heterodorks. That was Corinna Cohn, your other co-host of Heterodorks. And we have a return guest heterodork. It is Alex Gleason. Hello. Very happy to be here. Alex is a computer programmer nerd and a vegan. That's all the introduction he needs. Yep. We'll fill in the details. <laughs> well, he's he's an open source software developer, which means that He's not just writing a code like a mercenary like I do. He actually contributes to the community. Yep. And he runs Linux on his laptop, on his everyday laptop. And I'm a canceled man, a canceled feminist turf man. Well, you can't be a feminist, buddy. You're male. You can only yeah. be yeah, yeah. an ally. Yeah, that's what they say, not what I say. That, that partner of yours needs to keep you in line. She needs to police <laughs> your language more. That's right. So let me, let me ask you something, Alex. Since you are this uh, renowned transphobe that just cannot tolerate the existence of trans people at all, why are you on this podcast as a guest? Don't you feel like a hypocrite? I mean, obviously, <laughs> obvious answer is because it's not true. Oh. Whoops. Whoopsie. Whoops. Maybe it's partial. Maybe you're a partial transphobe. Are there some trans people that you hate? Here's what I hate. I hate anime avatars on the internet. Does it matter to me what their gender or sexual orientation is? That's where I draw the line. That would be a, a weeb, weebophobe. Weebophobe. Yep. That's right. Exactly. Weebophobe. There you weebophobic. go. Ah, yes. There I think go. I am too, actually. But actually, I was thinking that Alex is, in fact, trans. Yeah. <sighs> right? Because well, he, he does have the beard. Yeah. And I was thinking that he he's a gender special i think his gender is uh vegan or v v gender vet oh. vet gender right because it's a crucial part of his identity i will say i i am a difference yeah but like but also you're you're only attracted to other vegans can we all agree that fried tofu is actually delicious though hell yeah hell yeah well i mean with the right sauces but anyway what i really want to find out about is what the what the hell did you do alex so and i don't even know how we're going to get listeners to get up to speed here we had alex on before when heterodorks had four listeners and now we're up to how many listeners are we up to 132 or is it more i i, I don't remember i thought it, i thought it was 68 or 70 or some number in between very nice you can go back and listen to the episode where we interviewed Alex, but uh, Alex has gotten into all kinds of trouble. He's a programmer and he created Soapbox, the Soapbox front end platform, and now the Soapbox back end. Is that correct? Yeah, so it's, it's federated social media. Uh, I guess I should give a little bit of context behind it. It's, it's this idea that um, people can join in the global conversation similar to Twitter, um, but people can can start their own servers on uh, on their own URL. So it's very similar to email in the way that it works. Like you can have your at AOL.com, your at Yahoo, at Gmail or whatever. People can create servers on domain names and then they can hmm. cross communicate with each other. So mine is Gleasonator.com. That's my personal server. But I've also launched Spinster.xyz. Uh, I'm known for contributing to to post p o a dot s t. Um, these are domain names, and so I can between any of these servers, I I can follow someone on a different server, and so like my full username would be at alex at gleasonator dot com. That second at symbol there, you know, determines the server name. And my little quasi social media site is called Neenster dot. I guess it's neister.org, right? <laughs> so it's been a great time yep. to have a brain Not fart work. when I'm talking about my own site. <laughs> uh, I use it every day. 
and I can communicate with other people across the Fediverse and it runs Soapbox and Alex set it up for me. That site exists to lure people away from Facebook and introduce them to the Fediverse. For sure, yeah. The good thing about it is freedom. Um, that's really the reason it exists is freedom from tyrannical big tech corporations that you know actually have real control over our day-to-day -day lives. I first heard about the Fediverse because of Spinster, which runs on the platform that Alex wrote, I guess, although it was a fork of Gab, right? And when it started? Yes, it was. And that very fact, the very fact that you had anything to do with Gab was enough to get you canceled yes. right off the bat from, you got blacklisted from Mastodon, right? And Spinster also got blacklisted. Right, exactly. I mean, just to be clear, Mastodon is a piece of software, so anyone can run it. Um, they could run it if they were pro-free speech, if they're anti-free speech, but it just happens so the majority of those servers are anti-free speech. And for them, the point of building this alternative social network is that they want actually more censorship, that Twitter is not censoring enough. And that to me is really bizarre because I think that it goes against the way the network actually works from a technical standpoint. It really wants to be um, geared towards freedom of speech because it's very easy to set up a new domain, set up a new server. Blocking content on the Fediverse is hard. How do you think that happened, right? I mean, it, it really exemplifies a shift in the culture of ostensibly open source people. 10 years ago, open source and free software was about freedom and free speech. And culturally, my God, it's changed. Yeah. So wokeness definitely has, has really overtaken open source. And I would say that that, that is actually the word, not trannyism or whatever. It's wokeness. And that's just seeped, it's come from the big tech companies like Google and Facebook and kind of seeped through into open source and now down into these projects like Mastodon. You know, they, they have rules like if you want to start a server and you want to be listed on the official Mastodon page, then you have to have rules against uh, transphobia and things like that. Like if someone makes a comment, if someone uses words then you have to ban them. Well, that's retarded. <laughs> it's pretty retarded. Yes, I would agree. Like they can't just say, if you use words, they have to be banned. They have the specific words, right? Like they- Right, it's specific words, but you know, that's what it kind of boils down to. There's all these accusations slung around of, oh, so-and-so is a Nazi, but am I really murdering 6 million Jews? No, I said words and it doesn't make any sense. So I realized that Neenster is on a blacklist and the reason <sighs> given is, uh, what is it? Terrorism? Uh <laughs> they just come up with all of this ridiculous shit. Yeah. I don't know what to say about it. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so there are these kind of like sub communities of people who are really just trying to be angry all the time, um, on this network and, and they go out and they actually seek people, they find them just so they can blast them and they so they can say, you should ban this server, you should ban this person, whatever. And so this resulted in a great divide in the Fediverse where you have these sort of extremes. Um, you have the people that are very pro-censorship and people who are very anti-censorship. And it kind of makes sense when you look at the way Twitter is because it, Twitter and the other social, like mainstream networks are somewhere kind of in the middle. And so the people who are not happy with that are the ones who go and seek this alternative. What I want to do is actually to make the Fediverse mainstream. I want the Fediverse to win. What would you say, Alex, is a demographic characteristic of somebody who uses the Fediverse as a choice over using something like Facebook or, or Twitter? What, what makes a Fediverse user distinctive from other social media users? Yeah, who are they? They're, they're nerds primarily because mm -hmm. they've gotten to a point where they actually understand this enough to use it. And that's the challenge that I'm trying to break through right now is how to bring this to regular people who are not necessarily nerdy, who, who maybe don't even necessarily understand the underlying technology or care. But then once they experience it, then they realize why it matters. But they're not all nerds. Some of them are people who are in free software, free culture communities. 
like cultural aspects of it. And they may not be nerds themselves. Cause I, you know, when I was, before I was canceled being a free speech, free culture advocate, I had a lot of connections with other people who were free culture people. And a lot of them are using the Fediverse because they're aware of the social dangers of walled gardens, like Facebook True. and Twitter. Uh, but they've almost all of them have taken on this censorship mentality. Yeah, I would personally qualify those people as nerds. Although I do agree there are plenty of people who are not nerds. Like Spinster, for example, is a great example of grandmas on the Fediverse. And, but that is because of my work on Soapbox and bringing those mainstream people in. Yeah, and just the existence of Spinster. Spinster is the only, or was when it started, was the only woman-centered social media it was the only place you could go where you wouldn't be banned for saying things like women don't have penises that kind of thing right exactly it's not a particularly uncommon view within the existing fediverse that we don't want this to grow we want this to be a niche community of angry toxic nerds and my goal is to steamroll over those people and use this amazing technology that can bring lots of value to people. I think they're selfish because they just wanted to take it all for themselves. But I, I think that it could change the world and that they are trying to keep it away from people. Isn't it, doesn't it seem like though, if that's what they want, isn't the whole point that you can control your communities? So if you don't like people, you can just block them yes of course i mean that's what i've always that's what i've always said um if you don't if you want your little niche community then and this goes back to that divide between the two parts of the fediverse the really free speech people and the anti-censor or and the pro-censorship people um and it's it's weird because the real solution to to these pro-censorship people is just whitelist federate and what that means is the current model is a blacklist model where you say door is wide open, come on in to literally every other server. Um, and then if there's ones you don't like, you have to individually block those servers. And so that means that every single day there might be new ones spawning up that you're looking after mm. trying to trying to block. And so that's where this hashtag called hashtag Fetty block has arisen from is these people who have nothing better to do with their time than to go and to seek out these quote unquote Nazi servers and to blast them on hashtag Fetty block and say, you need to block this or that person because like he said something I don't agree with. He said words. And, and so then that's how it happens. Um, it, like the really obvious thing is if, if that's the problem that you're dealing with, then maybe you should just say, okay, by default, I don't federate with any other server and I'm going to choose which people that I want to talk to. But I think the reason they don't is because they actually do love being angry and it, it gives them something to do. It gives them a sense of purpose, um, gives them something to be egotistical about and knock other people down over. And it, it's very toxic. They like lists. I mean, it's it's a, a block list is a blacklist. And there is some thrill i think people get from maintaining blacklists well let, let me try to steel man that a little bit though what if somebody started using the fediverse to distribute pornography and let's let's say that it's not even something that is plainly illegal pornography but something that's offensive anyway and maybe it's revenge pornography what if people just uh came up with a way of exploiting soapbox to just add a add a brand new revenge porn instance into the Vetiverse every day or every hour. Wouldn't a block list be useful in that case? Yes. Absolutely. I think, yes, there are use cases for block lists, 100%. For spam as well. Spam is another problem that we deal with um, that presents a, a new and unique challenge on the Vetiverse. But I think these are problems that are solvable. It's just that we need to have enough momentum behind the idea to begin with that we want to actually solve these problems. And at the moment, 
there really mm-hmm. is no money behind it right now. There's no sponsorship, no corporations. The best we have is is there are some European nonprofits who do fund some of these projects like Mastodon. Mm-hmm. But it's one of those things where it's not a low hanging fruit. Like the people who are out trying to get money right now are like, oh my God, we need to make NFTs of gorilla monkey pictures because that is a low hanging fruit. This is something that's harder, but it has a lot of potential. And if someone can actually put money behind this and do it right, then I think that it could be explosive. So speaking of money, uh, the, the Trump site, the Trump social media site, what is it called? Truth social? I mean, let me say this. So you know I'm vegan, right? I'm basically in many ways still a libtard. I will openly admit that. However, I don't think that Donald Trump should have been banned on Twitter. I felt pretty strongly about it at the time. And when it happened, I thought, oh my God, I hope that he runs a server on the Fediverse because it would just, it would make sense and it would, it would, it would not make sense if he didn't. And and so that's really like, I'm in this for free speech. All right. I think that it's okay for people to have conversations about things with words. Right. You think that it's okay for people to have conversations, but then you also think uh, spam is not speech. There is a fine line. Um, but I think, yes, automated spam. I mean, I've seen some of these attacks before including on sites like Spinster, where they will do interesting things like automatically generate hundreds of subdomains, uh, generate accounts, and then spam like one particular user with the same message over and over and over again in order to flood their notifications. And there there are technical solutions that we've built to solve these problems. But yes, I do not consider that to be speech. Right. And and I don't either. And as somebody who's a somebody who calls myself a free speech advocate, I do find that I have to hit these corner cases and start justifying, well, this is speech and this isn't speech. And I don't always feel comfortable about that, to be honest, because I think if somebody crafts an advertisement and their purpose of it is for that advertisement to be understood and for that to provoke some sort of response, then it would be weird to say, well, but nevertheless, that isn't speech. Yeah. So in terms of the way I moderate my own servers, um, I they're small and that makes this this task a lot easier for me. And I think that is something that makes this problem easier to solve on the Fediverse is that is that you kind of have these smaller communities, which I think really goes in line with human nature as well, because I think humans are tribal by nature. Um, and I don't I don't mean that in a bad way either. I, like it's possible for people to form communities that are very positive in this way. Um, and, and because of that, I can know with a high level of certainty that the majority of my users are real people. Um, and yes, it, it makes me feel uncomfortable when people write like graphic grotesque descriptions of things, or if they share like pornography or things that I don't like. Um, but I think that the freedom on the Fediverse is not in individual users, it's within the servers. And so being able to block someone else's server is actually freedom. Being able to block some someone else's account is freedom. And so that's the thing that creates freedom for me, not just the fact that, that people can say whatever they want, but also that people can choose not to listen. Hmm. Okay. And in an ideal fetty world everybody would have their own server so they wouldn't be at the mercy of somebody else blocking they would be able to decide for themselves whereas if you just have a what is it it's a mastodon yeah, it's account been an ongoing debate i think there's there's different types of people there are leaders and there are followers and i think that that it makes sense for leaders to run servers but for people that don't want to deal with the content moderation side of things, they might not want to actually have that be part of their social media experience. That can be very stressful to have to see all of this content that you don't like and then decide whether or not you want to want to block it. And that's it's been a discussion for a while now of 
different ways of structuring federated platforms. One of them is the is the idea that every user gets their own um, platform independent of the others. But I think this model, this sort of in between the fully distributed model and the centralized model, uh, is the best, and it's it's the most relevant because of the fact that you have these middlemen um, that can perform that task for you. Neenster is called Neenster because I'm Nina and I had all these followers on Facebook. And the idea was like, well, join my server. You don't have to know anything about the Fediverse. You don't have to know anything at all. If you like my taste, if you trust my judgment, then you know, you don't have to think about any of this. Like I'm going to block some people and I'm going to block them according to my own whims. And if you trust my whims, it's a great place for you. What if you stop winning and the people who joined your instance of the Fediverse are tired of the way that you monitor your content, or maybe you've just got burned out and you disregarded your server and somebody says, well, I, I want to continue my network, but I want to move my identity over to Alex's network because Alex is doing a better job at spam moderation. Do you have to like give up your network or can you, can you migrate that over to somebody else's instance? Yeah, this, this is a problem that Twitter is actually trying to solve right now with their blue sky protocol, which is something that they have been working on for three years and doesn't currently exist. Hmm. So, so it is, it's a somewhat challenging problem to solve because it kind of means that the user needs to have like their own key pair or whatever in order to do this. Those solutions are not very user friendly. I, I honestly think this is a problem. The problem of moving from one server to another is not really a problem. I think you can just create a new account on the other server. Um, and it's not a huge deal. And if you really are a person that finds themselves moving around a lot, then maybe it's time for you to just start your own server. Speaking of the feds, let me ask another question. <laughs> so there's okay. been a, a number of instances this year of men who were born in 1999 or 2000 or 2001 mouthing off on social media before they go and they start shooting up a, a public space. And that it seems that no matter uh, who this individual is, that the operator of the social network where they mouthed off is going to get some sort of uh, court summons. So if I am operating a Fediverse instance, do I have some li potential liability? Could be. Um, mm. I would say on a very small server, probably not, but I mean, it does come with, you know, creating a website on the internet where people can say things. The fact that it is federated does not, is not as significant as the fact that it has users that can write comments, but yes, that is an unfortunate aspect that the website operators have to deal with for sure. One of the comments that I saw on the reaction to your being uh, ejected from the Pleroma project was some somebody, and I'm sure you don't endorse this in any way, Alex, but I'm going to ask for your reaction to it. Somebody on that thread said, uh, this is why you should never have trannies working on your open source project. What do you think? About yeah. So that? my view has always been that anyone can contribute. Um, I think that the, the projects that I have worked on are actually more inclusive than many of theirs, because I, it's, it's not that I can't work with transgender people or whatever It's that they don't want to work with me because they don't like that. I have certain thoughts in my head. I don't care. I don't care what people do with their time or what they think. I'll work with someone who's religious, who's not religious, who's gay, straight. I mean, if Adolf Hitler did submit a merge request that improved things for everyone in the open source community, I might not like him. But I would smash merge on that on that one particular merge request because like I don't think that's the thing that matters or the thing that we should focus on. This is a very idealistic view in a way though, because I'm and I'm, again I'm gonna I, I basically agree with you, but I want to steel man this to try to think this out a little bit. 
if I'm a, a, a Jewish tranny, which I sort of am, and I see that this project is allowing Adolf Hitler to merge items into the, into the source code, one of the things I'm going to think is, oh my God, uh, Hitler's part of this project. And I think that maybe the worst thing that could happen is if I try to file some code, maybe Hitler is going to start putting comments onto my pull request. And, and given his attitudes about Jews and possibly trannies, it's too late to ask him, I might get a, a lot of really hostile comments. And so at, at minimum, I think one of the things that I might like to see before I feel comfortable putting myself out there is some sort of statement on the behalf of the maintainers saying, hey, there's some uh, conduct behavior here. And so even, even if you'd take a pull request from Hitler, maybe one of the things that I really want to see is that I'm going to not be targeted by Hitler or his friends if I participate. Sure. Yeah, so the way that I run my open source projects, there's this thing in open source called BDFL, which stands for Benevolent Dictator for Life. All right. And it's not like like there's a community that gets to decide with a board of directors or whatever what's allowed and what isn't. I don't have any community guidelines. I just do what I think is right. And I think that I am a good leader and people want to work with me. Yeah. And on I and I don't think that an issue tracker is a free speech zone. And I will ban people from issue trackers if they harass my valuable contributors. Um, I protect my contributors at all costs. And that is actually a difference between the way I run things and the way the Pleroma community runs things. Um, you know, ironically, I'm complaining about being banned from Pleroma's GitLab, but if I were them, I would have banned many other people before me, before things came to this point. Because the reason why all of this happened is because of the sort of the toxic community, the comments, the um, the harassment that has come out of those issues. The, the harassment of, of you or just, uh, is that the culture yes. of the project? Of me, of me specifically, I became a scapegoat. Fancy that, a scapegoat again. By the way, Alex, were, were your antagonists trans or were they allies? I'm guessing they were allies. Yes. So there was one that was trans that was the one that started the whole shit storm like way back in the beginning. Um, and since then I've had, you know, people have left the project and said, I am leaving this project specifically because of Alex Gleason and the fact that he is destroying the Fediverse and he created Spinster. Wow. So Spinster is really, people really hate Spinster. Yeah. It's a pretty successful site too. It is. Um, so it's, it's strange going back to this divide in the Fediverse. Um, the general conception is that, is that the software that people run actually kind of coincides with each side of the divide. So you have your Mastodon people on your cancel culture side and you have Pleroma on the free speech side. Hmm. And it's, it's a bit strange. I don't know exactly how it happened. I think some influence of 4chan is what caused Pleroma to be like considered the free speech side, but, but even 4chan has kind of been imbued with wokeness these days. Uh, and, Wait, and so what? it's weird what? because- <laughs> 4chan is woke? These are the end times. Yeah. Yeah, I know, it's, it's crazy. Um, but it's, it's the direction the world is moving, I guess. And, and hopefully we're turning that around now, but, but yeah, it's, it's ironic because when you look at the people who run Pleroma servers, they tend to be the more free speech oriented ones, but the people who are developing it are not at all. Um, they are woke cancel, cancel culture retards. So this is like people, uh, whose job it is to build AR 15s and then, uh, mad that people are out owning guns. Yep. It's very bizarre. This seems really widespread throughout all tech culture. Like, is there any tech project that doesn't have this dynamic? In the open source world, soapbox. <laughs> well, it's because it's just you. I mean, you're the dictator. It's because you're the, the benign dictator for life. Yeah. Um, I don't know. 
That's a good question. I'm sure there are ones that are out there, but you know, a lot of people are scared and there are people who share our political views and just don't express them. Not, not that we even share all of our political views. It's just right. that, that, that between the three of us, we think that tofu is delicious and that sex is real. <laughs> <laughs> and people are weird. Exactly. And people are weird. And people are weird. I think it's really more a, a philosophical position than political. I mean, we all know that you can't have unlimited free speech everywhere, but I think that we, I think we all resist the idea of central authorities controlling, dictating to other people. Yes. And we are, we're all pretty free speech, like, uh, you know, with the pronoun issue, I think we all agree that it's up to the speaker which is, I mean, it, it seems like a little detail, but actually it really is, it really reveals people's authoritarian preferences that, that they actually think it's a good idea for one person to dictate how another person speaks and thinks. Oh, yeah, I agree. If it were up to me, I would force everybody to make up their own minds about which pronouns to use. <laughs> for yes. the, the projects that you're working on right now, including Soapbox, and maybe even including, I don't know, if I were in your position, I would be tempted to create a, I don't, I don't know what you think of Substack, that seems to be the, the latest blogger, but I would be tempted to even write up your experience uh, with the Pleroma. So is, is there public writing that you do? Is there anything that somebody should go look at to learn more about you or this particular issue? Yeah, I do have a blog at blog.alexgleason.me. Um, and right now there's only positive things about Pleroma on there because I haven't updated it in very long. All right. But, um, you know, I've thought about maybe writing things and certainly people have written things about me. But at the end of the day, what I'm really interested in is writing the code. And... I don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time talking about um, talking about these things in long form content because it's distracting me from writing the code. And if if you don't, maybe, uh, maybe I will. You raise a good point. Well, I, I, you know the, what I'm sensing from you, Alex, is that you've already been sort of a victim of this grievance culture, and it sounds like maybe you're you have some second thoughts about contributing to grievance culture with your own grievances, uh, this particular episode of Heterodorks accepted. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, the nice thing about this is that as obnoxious as it is, because it's an open source project, it's not really that bad, right? You made a fork and now you're just... Yeah, it's just my emotions at stake. It's not my future. Yeah, and it's not it's not the text future either. Right? Like you can just improve that for Exactly. And that's a wonderful thing about free software, open source software. So we can see this as a victory of open source. I, let me disagree with that. I'm oh. feeling disagreeable today, Mia. Awesome. I love it. Let's just I love disagreeing. So your projects are uh, distributed open source, you, you distribute your own work, but your cancellation has had a pretty tremendous impact on your ability to have your, your work viewed. And I think it's also the same in the open source world that if you um, become a pariah, even if your code is really good, it's not good enough to just create a fork of it because it's, there's the maximum that if you build it, they will come. But that's not necessarily true. If if people decide uh, yep. Alex could have the, the best code ever, but they think that he's not a good person, they it doesn't it doesn't matter. He might be the only person who ever uses his code. I do agree that's a problem. Um, and you know, an interesting thing about cancel culture is that you can leverage it for your own benefit. I could go and write blog posts or whatever, get attention to it, um, and maybe I will, but. For me, I think I'm just waiting until the right moment. 
I have long-term plans with this Fediverse stuff. And uh, I'm just trying to keep pushing that forward for now. I mean, I guess it could be worse. It would be worse if it were closed source. So it's not, yes. it's not that open source has solved all these problems. I mean, my own career would be, or my own, my own work would have been even more suppressed and harmed had it not been free culture, right? Like I would have had a publisher, the publisher would be a coward. The publisher would suppress all of my works and that would be that. So people can still find my works online and they're still encouraged to share those works. So it's preferable to the alternative. It's not, it doesn't solve these problems and uh, the, the culture is particularly bad. Like cancel culture, as we said before, is particularly bad, ironically, among these supposed free culture, free software people, which maybe is just, you know, the law of conservation of evil again. Maybe it's like you have, there's only so much freedom people can deal with and they think that they're dealing with it. They think they're super free in one respect and they're just clamping down like crazy and they don't even see it. I will say I've been pleasantly surprised at people who do disagree with me using my software. That's been happening more uh, a lot lately. For example, there's one um, anarchist website that has started using Soapbox and they're like far left wing, um, like communist, anarchist people, whatever. And I, I think that's really cool. I, I think that it is because the software is good at the end of the day that, and, and it, it is in fact the best software that is out there for the Fediverse right now um, has made a big difference. So it could be, and I also do think there is a cultural shift podcasts like this are making people aware of it, waking people up a little bit. And, and also, you know, there's this, the idea of, um, in the future, everyone will be canceled. And I think that, that maybe that is, that's starting to happen just enough that people are seeing that, Hey, maybe this is not a great way to do society. I hear you. I, I love it when people who find me repre reprehensible enjoy my art. That is the best. I care much more about the art than the artist. I sort of feel like we're climbing out of this crazy moment that we've been in for the last two years, little by little. Two years? You have a short memory. It's been at least five. Well, I guess we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, guys. All right, turfs and trannies. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, just a quick reminder, you're about to hear me do my recorded thing saying if you would consider contributing to our to Nina's Patreon or to our anchor.fm, please uh, give it a thought. Our software expenses have gone up a little bit and we've been eating more Chinese food. So if uh, you could consider giving two or three or five, hundred dollars a month that would be great but uh even if it's a smaller scale it would be appreciated you left off the thousand after hundred five hundred thousand dollars a month then we could hire then we could hire alex oh god you know we could we could hire <laughs> uh, we could hire a more marginalized tranny to do some of the editing work so your dollars at work yes the the grift is real until next time. Bye. Hey, everybody. Thank you for listening to Heterodorks. You can support our podcast by visiting anchor.fm slash heterodorks or by directly supporting Nina Paley on Patreon at patreon.com slash Nina Paley.